Bless us, Lord, now. May we do no damage, but preach that which becometh sound doctrine and gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Everybody say, tough, tough. Assignment. assignment. Allow me to begin this message by saying this. The God of the Bible is looking for tough people. Men and women or people that he can toughen to use in these last and evil days. The words, the admonishing of Gideon comes to mind. Gideon said, whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. He says, if you're fearful and afraid, go home. Can't use you. You don't qualify. Amen. God is looking for somebody who will walk in a degree of toughness or will allow the Lord to make them strong in this um, day of whiners, in this day where everybody's a victim. We have, we have a victimized uh, protest complaint society. You know you're in trouble when people, persons who are not even legally in the country, you're not, even, you're not even legally here and you protest. Now try that in any other country where you are not a resident of that country, a citizen of that country. Go there. I tell you what, go to Mexico and stand in the streets of Mexico and wave the U.S. flag and demand rights and, uh, and be a non-citizen and see how far you'll get with that. It's, what I'm searching for is we live in a grievance society. Everybody's got a grievance Women's march, They're, they have a grievance. Everybody's upset about something. Everybody's a victim. It seems like we try to outsad each other. See whose story, life story can be the worst. But the Lord is not looking for people who are filled with grief and sad stories. The Lord is looking for Somebody tough, someone strong to use. Are you listening to me? The times in which the prophet Elijah made his abrupt, bold, dramatic, and thunderbolt from the sky-like entry into the text were extremely hard and wicked. It was in the year 900 B.C., 100 years after the reign of King Solomon, 60 years after, the, after Israel was split into two kingdoms. You remember up until uh, Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, the son of David, who succeeded King Saul. Israel, under David's reign, was one nation. But in the days of uh, Rehoboam, the kingdom was split. Israel became referred to as Israel and Judah. That is, the northern kingdom, the kingdom of Israel, and the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah. Sixty years after the northern kingdom and the southern kingdoms were established, our text takes place. The intolerant, wicked, heathenistic, and cruel Baal worship dominated the landscape of the northern kingdom. John G. Butler said this uh, concerning this 
uh, Baal worship. He says, Baal was an heathenistic pagan god who was supposed to control rain and fertility. While, other, while over the centuries of heathen idolatry, there seems to have been many Baals the Baal worship in Israel during Elijah's day was considered to be the supreme male god. So the god who was supreme was Baal. Ashtaroth, called Ishtar by the Assyrians and Ishtarte by the Greeks and called Venus by the Romans was a supreme female deity. And Ashtaroth was associated uh, with the religion of Baal. Matter of fact, you seldom found one without the other. Where there was an altar erected to Baal, there were also poles that the King James Version translates and calls them groves. There were poles erected to this goddess Ashtaroth. And Ashtaroth was Baal's consort. She was Baal's, this goddess was Baal's wife or Baal's companion. So in uh, Samaria, where our text takes place, Samaria at this time was the capital of the northern kingdom. Baal worship and the worship of uh, Ashtaroth was everywhere. Let me say this to you about Baal Baal worship was morally rotten. It was vile, sensual, and wicked because it made immoral sex acts a religious exercise. Adultery, fornication, homosexuality, bestiality, wicked sexual behavior was a part of the religious rites. This is how you worshipped Baal. And Ashtaroth uh, wasn't much better. All of the priests of Ashtaroth, this female deity, the priests were punks. The men were homosexuals. Men were effeminate. We see this going on in society today. The feminists have come out of the woodwork. And there's a spirit now uh, where uh, uh, women are becoming, some of y'all don't like this, more manly. And the men are becoming increasingly girly. Uh, yeah, and, and weak. So, amen. Oh. It's not a new thing. It's not new. Baal was considered the god of fertility. You know what that's all about. So there was a lot of fertility rites that took place as they worshipped Baal. Leon Wood said this. He said, licentious dances were prominent and chambers existed for both male and female prostitutes. And there were chambers for whatever you want, whatever you like, whatever kind of prostitute you wanted to buy. You could buy your prostitute and, and participate in uh, orgies and uh, lap dances and uh, uh, wicked uh, sexual behavior. And all of this in the name of worshiping Baal and Asterisk. Baal religion terribly influenced the northern kingdom by dropping the morals of Israel to incredible depths and destroying the character uh, in mass. We've seen this thing happen in America. We've seen how morals have just fallen in this country. The new sin in America is to preach against sin. Oh yeah, 
when you cry out against what the Bible says is wrong. In biblical context, you're accused of being judgmental. Some of you are looking at me now, preaching what you're saying is hard. It's not hard, it's factual. It's factual. There are things that are happening in society uh, that are not right, and what we call love is not love. Love is not a license to do whatever you want. During the Super Bowl, they had a wicked commercial showing little newborn babies. And among the things they said about the babies, not newborns, oh, you will grow up and be able to love whoever you want to love. That's, 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 a, that's a nod to what God calls perversion. Oh, yeah. It's not new. Lastly, Baal worship was incredibly cruel because Baal worship, the Baal worship, the, the, the worshipers of Baal were quite intolerant. You should study the text and see how worshipers of Yahweh were slaughtered by people who worshiped Baal. Christians are accused of being intolerant. And I imagine there may be a few who are. But there's no place in the Christian doctrine where Christians kill people for not accepting the God of Christianity. There's no place in the Christian doctrine where the Christian, unlike the Muslim, is told to kill the non-believer. If there is a Christian terrorist, he's not one according to the doctrine. Christians do not kill people for not believing in Christianity. Christians die or kill. We are martyred because we will not give up our faith. We don't kill people for not believing. A Christian following the Bible is not going to crash a plane into any building and kill people because they wouldn't convert to Christianity. Christians have over the years died for what we believe, not killed others for failing to believe. And I know what some of you think. Well, what about the Crusades? The Crusades in this historical setting was a Christian's uh, response to the aggression of Muslims killing Christians as they were making the trek to Jerusalem to worship. And eventually, the Crusades erupted. But that's 1,400 years ago. Today, Christians aren't killing anybody. Baal worship was very intolerant. Have you noticed the, most, the people who cry tolerance are the most intolerant people? Because they do not tolerate Christian thought. They had a march uh, in Charlotte, a women's march, not too long ago. And they invited all women. Well, there was a bunch of women who were not allowed to march. They showed up with their banners. They weren't allowed to march because these women, they were women also, but they happened to like Donald Trump. And so the organizers said, you can't march. How is that being tolerant? See, we want to tolerate what we like. But be intolerant to what we don't like. You, you should see, I, I can sit down and talk to you about the efforts that have been put in place to try and silence people who preach like I do. The threats. Many, multiple times we've been cussed out. The plots, the, different, the various attempts to embarrass us. I was called to do a talk show, I'll never forget. And uh, I was told two weeks ahead of time that I would be on the show. I won't call his name. And uh, 
he told me, he said, we're going to put it off for a week or so because of some other things. And I told him, okay. And I assumed from what the way he talked to me was that the only guest would be me. And that he and I would sit down and discuss the issues. I went to the television station. And while I was sitting there, there was another rather charming lady sitting there. And so when they came to get me, I went into the studio and she went in also. I learned just minutes before we went on that she was my opponent. And that she had been given two weeks to study my positions. To go out online and find my talk. And uh, I had been given notice about her just then. And we walked into the studio and the host said to her, called her name and said, I want you to speak in that camera. Right. Then they brought so, another big wheel from the head office in the newsroom down and sent her across from me and told her, you talk in that camera. Now, we're 10 seconds before going into, on the air. And the man said, I'll speak to this camera. Five seconds before going on the air. So I said, well, what camera do I speak to? Two seconds before going on the air. Oh, you just catch on. Hello, this is, I almost called his name, and welcome to our show. We're here today. I said, oh, God, this is a setup. They, they brought me in to embarrass me. My crime was I believed that marriage was a union and still do between a man and a woman. With their uh, strategy they forgot one thing. There is no playbook for the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost says, you don't have to, even have to think of what you're going to say. Say, so at that time, the Spirit would tell you what to say. And uh, when it was over, the powers that be got mad with them because they thought that they had thrown softball questions at me. God let us beat them so bad till it seemed like everything was tilted in my favor. There's a growing intolerance, bear worship for God's truth. So let me read the context of it. Uh, chapter 16. I'm going to preach and get out of your way. Amen. Chapter 16 and verse 29 says, and in the 30th, the 30th and 8th year of Asa, king of Judah, began Ahab to reign the son of Omri. Reign over Israel. That is, he's ruling the northern kingdom. If you read chapters 11 and 12, you'll see what caused the kingdoms to divide, okay? And, uh, and Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 20 and 2 years. Are you with me? And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord. Look at this. Above all that were before him. An interesting footnote. All of the northern kingdom's dynasties were evil. There was not one righteous king in the northern kingdom. Praise the Lord. It started out the wrong way. I believe one of the reasons Mother Turner, God blesses the upper room, is our history. See, upper room is not the result of a church split. Upper room is not the result of a department going rogue. Upper room is not the result, you have to say amen, of someone fishing from someone else's church. The beginning of this church was pure. 
And that's one of the reasons why. It didn't start because there was a church fight and a church split and half the folk left the church and went over town and started another. No, no. God said to the man of God living in Rockingham, go to Rock and preach and the rest I will do. That's a powerful foundation. Powerful foundation. I thought I'd bring that up. And so uh, Ahab, it says, and it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. That is, he was more wicked than any of his predecessors, and all of his predecessors were wicked. The sin of Jeroboam was the number one sin of the Old Testament. It was the sin of idolatry. America is, is steeped in idolatry. The commercial out where the preacher leaves the church, and the preacher or the priest, he stops by the mosque and pre picks up the iman and they, they stop by another temple and pick up someone else and stop by another house of worship and pick up someone else and, and, all, and all these people represent different gods. Different religions, praise the Lord, religions that do not agree. Uh, all of them go and claim we're together. It's not of God. Jesus Christ claimed exclusivity. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He said, no man cometh to the Father but by me. And I'll tell you something else. When, the, when in John 10 and 10, where the scripture says, the thief cometh not but to steal, kill, and destroy, that thief is not referencing the devil in its original context. He is referencing, this is John chapter 10, false teachers who claim to be messiahs. Because if you go to John 10 and 1, he says, anyone who climb up any other way is a thief and a robber. He says, all who came before me who claimed to be the Messiah, who claimed to be a savior, were thieves and robbers. Then in verse 10, he says, and the thief cometh not, but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. No, but I am come, that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. Now, I believe Jesus. I believe his claim in being the only savior. Then I heard him, Luke write about him and say, and there's no other name under the heaven. Don't get me started. Given among men, whereby we might be saved. What a name. Somebody shout, Jesus. Jesus. Glory to God. Yes. I like the way it's crafted. I like the way it's written. Verse 31 says, and it came to pass as if it had been a light thing as if it was an insignificant development that the northern kingdom was just gave itself wholeheartedly to idolatry. Uh, and then it gets worse. It says uh, that they walked in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. And then I heard him say, says in verse, I'm still in verse 31, uh, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ephbel, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshiped him. One theologian said that uh, Baal controlled Jezebel. And Jezebel controlled Ahab. And Ahab controlled the northern kingdom. They were in trouble. The Bible says in chapter 20, look at this chapter 21, 1 Kings 21, 25 through 26 says, speaking of Jezebel, but there was none likened to Ahab which did uh, sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, 
whom Jezebel, his wife, stirred up. She incited. It was already in bad shape. But then when he married her, she said, oh, no, we got to, we got to, we got to up the ante. And look at this. This is chapter, 1 Kings chapter 21, verse 25. Verse 26 says, and he did very abominably in following idols according to all the all things uh, as did the Amorites whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. They began to walk in the ways of the people who owned the land. God took the land from the people because of their wickedness and gave it to Israel. And then he let Jezebel cause him to walk in the way that caused the other people to be defeated. So wickedness is reigning. Back to our text. I'm almost where I'm headed. Bible says, and he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. By this time, Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom. Are you with me? And Ahab, not only did he build an altar uh, to Baal in, and a temple to Baal, and Ahab made a grove. Remember the poles. And Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. He was a wicked king. These were wicked times. But God loved the people of the northern kingdom. These are wicked times in our nation. But God loves America. But God needed somebody who would speak for him. He needed somebody who would be strong enough Man enough, brave enough, needs someone who was not given to political correctness and uh, who would just uh, say what God wanted said, even if it caused pain, hurt feelings, and even caused drought even if it tank the economy and cause people to suffer. He needed somebody. Somebody say somebody. So, 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 so what does God do? The text says, without any introduction, without any preparations, without any foundation being laid, the text says, and this is his first time being introduced into scripture. The text says, and Elijah. Isn't that something? Elijah the Tishbite. Mm -hmm. Of the inhabitants of Gilead. Steps in. Good God Almighty. Let's, let's unpack this. First of all, his name. Elijah was the most significant name. For his time in ministry. Parents, be careful what you name your children. Amen. Names matter. If anyone has a name and there's no meaning to your name, change your name. It matters what you call yourself, what you're called. Names matter. Praise the Lord. Don't just name them something. You hadn't come out to anesthesia yet. Whatever. No, wait till you're sober thinking that. <laughs> Elijah is the combination of El and Jah. El means God. Jah means Jehovah. So the name Elijah means God is Jehovah. Or Jehovah is God. Some translate it, Yahweh is God. Or Yahweh is my God. El, God. Jah, Jehovah. Jehovah is God. In other words, uh, Elijah by name represented the true and living God. And, and let me tell you, every time they had to call his name, 
the very mentioning of his name was an affront to the worshipers of Baal and the worshipers of Asherah. For when you said Elijah, you were saying that somebody else is God other than Baal. And that somebody else is Jehovah. So we have the right name. I'm going to preach in a minute. So he walks in with the right name. Now, let's see. Uh, let's investigate his city. He was from a land called, a little town, insignificant town, called Tishbe. A little community uh, near the Jordan River. Very little known about it. It's on the east side of the Jordan. Somebody from the west side, on the east side. He was on the east side of the Jordan. All right? I hear they really get down over there. <laughs> So now, but we know a whole lot about the region. But gave you his name, his city, but let me look at the region and it'll tell you why this man. Gilead was the region. Gilead was a rugged, mountainous area just east of the Jordan. Joseph Parker said this, quote, there was a wonderful similarity between the man, Elijah, and the region. Stern, bleak, grand, majestic, and awful were they both. Hallelujah. The land of Gilead was a stern land, but a majestic land, for it had beautiful mountains, a bleak land, a hard land. And Elijah was a man of that land. One writer said, Elijah therefore was no softy. He was no whiner. You wouldn't have found Elijah, praise the Lord, uh, with a bunch of earrings in his ears, pants hanging off of his rear end, praise the Lord, we're holding up his hair in a puff like he's a girl. Dying in all kind of weird colors, broke wrist, limp wrist, soft Michael Jackson voice. No, sir, Elijah was a man come from a tough region, a tough man with a tough outer shell and a tough disposition. I feel like preaching, praise the Lord. And uh, uh, yes, he was the man. He was not a man who would flop in the face of opposition. According to Smith, Gilead, uh, the word Gilead really, it literally means rock region. So the man was from the rock region. God Almighty, the mountains of Gilead included Pisgah, Abiram, and Peor, and had a real elevation of over 2,000 to 3,000 feet. This place was something. And those mountains, they were uniform. It looked like a, a, a massive uh, a wall running down the middle of the horizon. Gilead was specifically noted, you remember, for its balm. It's our sad. I think it was the prophet Jeremiah who wanted to know, is there no balm in Gilead? Yes, the apologist tells us that Gilead was a largely unsettled land during this era. So it was a rugged, tough frontier. Gilead, only the strong survived. There were no government safety nets. Hallelujah. Nobody, uh, nobody there to just hold your hand. You had to be tough. The times were tough. So what does God do? He goes over in the hood and finds a tough guy. Raises up a man, hallelujah, who didn't need an amen corner. Raised up a man who knew he was a man. 
Anytime a man's man get in place, uh, because we're so un un unaccustomed to seeing men now, everybody gets all hot and bothered. Get all upset because we're, we're constantly uh, accustomed to seeing men shrink and shrink and shrink. Well, Elijah was no shrinker. God said, now, go tell, praise the Lord, uh, Ahab, what I want him to know. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you, you know, it was a death sentence to approach the king uninvited. It was a death sentence to speak without the king pointing his scepter at you and giving you permission. Elijah, with his bad self, walks up in the king's palace. By the way, with Jezebel sitting there on the throne. So there's the king and the queen. And here comes this man who there is argument as to whether or not Elijah was even Hebrew. Because most of the time in scripture, when the Hebrews are introduced, their lineage is introduced. So and so, the son of this one. And the son of that one. But with Elijah, we don't know who his mother and father was. We just know the region that he came from and the town that he came from. It is highly speculated that he joined himself to Tishbe, but he was God's man. And he walked in there and he said to King Ahab, he said, as the Lord God and the word Lord that is literally translated either Yahweh or Jehovah. So he actually said, as Jehovah God liveth, and by the way, he's my king before whom I stand. He said, there shall be no dew nor rain. Now let me tell you one more thing and then we're getting ready to go home. I've told you about that. It was 900, uh, it was the year 900 BC. 100 years after Solomon and 60 years after the split. But let me tell you what time of the year it was. It was during the rainy season. The rainy season was on. That rainy season was from October to January. Every year during that time, the rains would come and they would fall torrentially. And here's this man walking up in the midst of the rainy season. See, it wouldn't have been anything had it been the dry season, but it was the rainy season. He steps up and says, in the midst of the rainy season, there shall be no dew nor rain until I say so. Isn't God a mighty God? You know it took a whole lot of courage to walk up in there and say that. And it takes courage today to stand up on your job, to stand in your community, to talk to your family members, even to say it in the church because you know you never you never know who's in the audience and you never know who's taping you if you stand up today and say that the bible is right you're accused of being judgmental if you declare abortion wrong you're accused of not having understanding if you disagree with the lbgtq on any subject you're called homophobic that's why you got to let God give you courage let the Lord make you strong do I have anybody here who wants to be used by the Lord you want God to take you and anoint you well you got to let him toughen you up got to stop all that whining and complaining and begin to praise the Lord and declare that God is good and, 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 and thank God for the privilege of being used by him. Would you lift your hands and say, Lord, here I am. Make me strong. Toughen me up because I want to be used in these last days. Somebody tell him, yeah. 
Yes! And let me tell you what else God did. After he makes his announcement, the Bible says that the Lord told uh, Ahab, told the king, told the prophet, told Elijah, he said, now get thee up, get up and leave. The Lord came to him and said, get thee hence and turn eastward and hide thyself. Who was you hiding from? Hiding from Ahab. But was he hiding out of fear? No. Let me tell you what the hide was all about. It, is, it was understood. It was understood that it was a divine rebuke. It was divine rejection. When something catastrophic happened and you couldn't find a priest, you couldn't find a preacher, you couldn't find a prophet, and if you couldn't get a word from God, then you knew that God had rejected you. Well, after Elijah made his declaration, he went and hid, and the rain stopped falling, and the rain stopped falling, and it didn't rain. And as time went by, they tried to find God, tried to hear a word from the Lord, but they couldn't find the man of God. That, that represented God shutting up heaven, that there be no rain. We serve a God who's got power. Y'all talking about global warming. The Lord is in charge. Hallelujah, Jesus. And he's speaking to us every day. And he told the man of God, go hide yourself down by the brook Shinnereth. I've spoken to the ravens, flesh-eating birds. But instead of eating the flesh, they're going to bring you a meal. You'll drink from the brook and eat from the ravens. What am I saying? He will give you a supernatural blessing. Somebody today, you need something from the Lord. You need a supernatural blessing from God. I'm here to tell you that he's in the blessing business, but you gotta let him make you strong. You gotta let him toughen you up. Stop whining every time life gets a little rough. Stop crying every time the going gets a little tough. The choir didn't know what I was going to preach. And I didn't know what they were going to sing. But if you let God toughen you up, your soul will look back and wonder, Yeah, yeah, Lord. Somebody praise him in this place. Woo! Oh, I can't hear you praising God in here. Shake somebody's hand and tell them we're going to make it. We're going to make it. And neighbor, you can make it. If you try, don't spend all your time crying, but get busy. The journey of a thousand miles began with one step. You got to step out and believe that God will make a way for you. The Lord will keep you strong. We serve the God of Elijah and the same God, the same God who anointed Elijah has anointed us and given us power, power to lay hands on the sick, power to cast devils out, power, your hands and just ask God right now Lord toughen me up yeah. it takes toughness to go against the grain it takes being tough 
to swim uphill, to say what's not popular. It takes being t tough to stick with it, even when you're preaching and you see people get up and walk out, because you know you done made a man. That ain't what I come for, but go on. But I'm still gonna say what God says. Still gonna let the Lord, somebody shout something. Still gonna stand for him. Because if I stand for the Lord, the Lord will stand for me. If you stand for him, he'll stand for you. Elijah went in, made his declaration. Jezebel sitting there, everybody's scared of her, including Ahab. She was the king. The, the, the first feminist enjoyed dominating men. Women like that marry weak guys. I was doing all right a minute ago, wasn't I? Yeah. Ahab tried to take Nabal's vineyard. Nabal said, no, I want my vineyard. It's my vineyard. No, you can't have it. Ahab go home crying to his wife. Jezebel said, oh, you want that vineyard? I'll get you the vineyard. That's the problem. That spirit is alive and well. On both sides. The sin of Adam was that he abdicated his responsibility. He stepped down. The sin of Eve was she usurped her authority. She stepped up. Both of them were there talking to the serpent. Now had Adam been worth his salt, the serpent go to talking to his wife, Adam should have said, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, stand right here, baby. Look, since, the, since it was Adam whom God had talked to, it was to Adam that the Lord said, uh, you will not eat of this tree. Eve wasn't even created. She hadn't even been created yet. It was to Adam. It was to Adam. Am I still in the Bible? But why y'all won't say amen? Because I have a bunch of feminists in here. But back to this. That's another sermon for another time. It's the truth. So... He made his stand. He was a man for his times. Upper room, visitors, saints, we've got to be people of our time. I believe that God raised us up for such a time as this. I believe he positioned us for such a time as this. But you got to walk in it. Some, too, too many of us stumble and fumble too much. Whine too much. Too needy. It's time now. It's time to allow the Lord to toughen you up. It's time. Matter of fact, it's high time. Time, straighten out your house. Husbands and wives, get with one accord. Praise the Lord. Kids, now, these little children got to be raised, but some of you teenagers, look at me, you, you, you fight help. Now, I'm going to tell you, I ain't going to spend but so much time, but I, when I tell you what to do, if, if you don't do it, you're on your own. So we, we ain't going to be talking, going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and, and then you're not going to follow my counsel. That cuts that off. Lose my number, because I, got, I, got, I, got, I have things to do. Amen. There, there, there are troops to run through. Walls to leap over. Hallelujah. Ain't, ain't nobody going to stay in the hole, hole in your hand, because every other week you're trying to kill yourself. 
No, come on. Wake up. Let God make you strong. Because you never know. You may be his next Elijah. And then when he gives you the chance, when he gives you the chance, take it. When you, when you get that opportunity to speak up when it matters most, take it. Father, I want to be a man for the times in which I live. We talk about Bishop Mason's day. And that's wonderful. But we got a major in the day, the time in which we live. Idolatry is on the road, on the, on the rise. America changed more in the last eight to nine years. We, we legalized. Immorality. I, I can't get past that. We change, we redefine marriage. Put transgenders in the military. Oh, about 30 years or so ago, instituted one of the greatest blows to the family, and it left us rocking and railing when we introduced. Uh, and this was under Reagan. These other things I mentioned was under Obama. No fault divorce made it easy for us to just dissolve the marriages. Daniel Patrick Monahan in the 60s warned, warned us when 25% of our children was born to out of wedlock families. He warned the black community that if we don't change in our immoral ways, that our immor immoral behavior will take back all of the gains that we won through the civil rights era. And when he said that, black people called him a racist because he was white. Now here we are and 70% or better of our children are born to single parent families. I think, if he, I don't know whether he was a racist or not, but I sure wish we would have listened to him because we would have been better off with 25% with, with, uh, 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 and reduced that, that number than not listening, and now here we are, 70%. That affects, that affects upward mobility. It affects a person's uh, 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 identity of themselves. Oh, and notice how it is so easy for us to gravitate to worldly things, but we resist the Bible. See, we'll grab hold to, a, to an African proverb. I guess we grabbed it because she knew what to, to do to get us to grab it, uh, for Hillary to say it and then say it's African. Work every time. African proverb said it takes a village to raise a child. The Bible says it takes a mom and a dad. But we live in a day now where we treat dads and, and moms as though they're disposable. Hence the, the, uh, the growth of same-sex parents. Two women, there's no man there. Two men, there's no woman there. How many of you guys believe that a, that a man could have taken the place of your mother? Raise your hand so I can cut it off. Amen. You, ten men could have taken the place of my mother. And ten women could have taken the place of my father. The Bible teaches that the eyes of the Lord seek if run to and fro in the earth looking for someone for God to show himself strong on their behalf. God's just like the Uncle Sam poster. Looking for you. He's looking for you. He's looking for you. Hallelujah. But you got to be ready. Got to be ready. Don't let your life experiences make you jaded and fragile and mad and upset. You hate everybody who don't look like you. 
letting people make you hate your own country. It's, a, it's an interesting paradox going on. You have Hispanics who are fighting with everything they got to stay here. You got blacks who are fighting with everything they got to help the Hispanics stay here. Then when blacks uh, talk amongst themselves, we say a black man can't get ahead here. We can't, we can't do anything here. Because you know this country is against us. But you know what we ought to do? We ought to, we ought to have a meeting. And uh, let the blacks and the Hispanics, tell the white folks stay home, and, and, and say, tell the Hispanics, y'all do the talking, remind us of why you're working so hard to stay here. They will say in good English, bad English, and in some cases, no English at all, you can make it here. Y'all just forgot. But you got to tough it up. Somebody shout something. You can be delivered from any malady. Jesus is a deliverer. The blood of Jesus still sets people free. But you got to be willing to fight for your deliverance. Fight back. Stop begging the devil. Please, Mr. Devil, please leave me alone. I'm tired of you, devil. No, you don't you know, please, you command him. In Jesus' name. And then you just stand there. All three or four feet of you. Just stand there. You may be small of stature. But if you got a heart full of God, got a heart full of Jesus, the devil can't stop you. Your pockets can be empty, but if your heart is filled with faith, the devil can't stop you. Life hidden you, hidden you, hidden you. Somebody wrote me the other day, said, Preacher, I'm going through, I want to get back to church. I said, listen, and, uh, and they're in the building. I'm so glad to see them. I said, listen, let me tell you this. And, and it got them through. I said, you got to see what you're going through differently. You won't, you, you're looking at it. Pray for me so my situation can change so I can get back. But consider that God has you where you are right now. Consider that the Lord Jesus has placed you in this predicament. And while you're here, see, because all trials have their appointed time. No trial lasts forever. Job said, all the days of my appointed time shall I wait until my change come there is a duration this won't last forever it won't be this way always so father if you have allowed me to go through this for now then lord i rest in your care i trust your decision and i'm just going to enjoy you and praise you and trust you and let you lead me until you bring me out. After a while, it's been dark. After a while, look around and there's the sun. There's the sun. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Lift your hand. Find yourself thanking the Lord that this storm is past. Hello, sunshine. It's mighty good to see you, bright sunshine. Hello, hello, sunshine. It's been dark. For such a long time, it's been dark for a long time. 
Can't explain what I've been through. Trying to live, oh Lord, my life without you. Seemed as if it would never cease to rain. But you've got the power to make it all change. Hello, hello, sunshine. It's mighty good to see you, bright sunshine. Hello, hello, sunshine. It's been dark for such a long time. It's been mighty, 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 mighty. Well, it's been done for a long time. It's been mighty, 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 mighty. Woo! Good God of oh I want to open the altar. Lord, make me strong. Come and let me pray for you. Lord, make me strong. Give me the strength of Elijah. God, make me strong. The devil been trying to pull me out pull me out of my church take me away from you to break my spirit to make me crack under pressure uh, I can't explain what I've been through uh, trying to live my life without you well seems as if it will never cease to rain uh, you got the power uh, and you made it all change. Hello, hello. Good to see you. Hello. Sunshine. It's been dark for a long time. Just like Elijah, God made a way for a long time. It's been dark for a long time. God Almighty, lift your hands, lift your hands and worship Him right now. Worship the Lord. Worship the Lord.